Welcome to another Melbourne Coco Heads presentation, recorded at the offices of Deloitte Online on July the 14th, 2011. This month, Patrick Richards talks about his open source project, DC Introspect. Our second speaker for the evening is Patrick from uh, Domestic Cat Software. Um, Patrick's just actually released a pretty cool tool that I thought you guys might be interested in um, seeing. I'm not sure whether you've seen it already, but I'll let him explain it a little bit more. Uh, thanks, Sean, and thanks to the guys at Deloitte for hosting and putting on a great night, of course. Um, as Sean said, I'm Patrick Richards, and my company is Domestic Cat Software. That's actually the name. And by company, that means me. So not. we've got a bit of a contrast between Deloitte and myself. <laughs> so it's probably good and a bit of a contrast between the talks as well. Um, I'm going to be talking about my open source project called DC Introspect, which is basically a project that was written for developers. It's really only a debugging tool. It's not something that none of this code should ever go to the store. Not that there's that much wrong with it, but it's just it's not built for that. It's really a debugging tool and you can get it on GitHub there. Um, the best way to distill it down is it's a simple tool for debugging visual interfaces. So really that's about it. It kind of it gives you a little bit of a suite of different things that you can use if you're building your app in a number of different ways. If you don't use Zibs, um, a play up, they don't use Zibs. I don't know why, but well I do know why it doesn't play nice with their version control. But if you Basically, any sort of view that you're building dynamically, which is most things that you're doing really, so any sort of scroll view, a table view, which is a scroll view, if you're moving anything around dynamically or changing its frame, then basically what you have in the app is going to be different to what you've either created in your zip or in code, because it can move around, obviously. So a couple of good examples where it would be helpful to have something like this. Pulse, obviously you've got a scroll view with scroll views nested in that with images and labels and on the left that's part of a bigger view bigger view hierarchy and the Twitter apps another good example they're throwing table views left right and center all over the place that's my app down there shameless plug um, all those little controls are separate views that are created dynamically from data and they can actually be moved around by the user anywhere and so zibs are obviously worthless for something like that. And another good example is actually the home screen, which is just a giant scroll view, and then the static part down the bottom. And that whole thing moves up to expose, again, a bigger view hierarchy with the, um, the switcher on the side. So let's show a quick demo. So basically, this is what it's like when you run it. As you can, everything's logged through uh, the console there. And to start it up, you just hit the space bar, and then it starts up. And so once you start it up, you just click around, and you can discover where your views are at. It shows you the exact frame. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> uh, <laughs> gives you the coordinates to the screen's edges. You can hit. <laughs> you can hit P, and it will give you all the properties, starting with the the properties that inherit from UI view and then down the bottom you can see the properties on the label itself and if you go to a button hit P again and it will give you the UI view properties and also the targets and actions so that's pretty handy um, so you can see there's an action I've set up to remove demo view so I'll just get rid of that and it's actually a really good thing with using this is it's really good for pulling apart Apple's own UI kit views um, and seeing how they put them together because they're pretty sophisticated and a lot of the time you'd think of it as one view but actually it's a lot of views put together so this segmented control has got a UI segment and then a label and then its own thing over there and text field is just ridiculous amount of little views happening in there the table view is just every little thing is a view so it kind of, it almost strays you away from using core graphics to do things because it's obviously all these are images that they're just gluing together. 
So it's a little bit depressing when you go and learn core graphics and then you realize that actually images is probably a better option all of the time. Um, so that's some of the basics. So some of the other things it can do just quickly are uh, outlining every view on the screen. So already on that one that I was showing you, you can see there's a problem up the top there. There's actually a, a page control that was invisible. Um, it's, this has happened to me where I fired up this tool on an old app and looked and found views that were invisible. I didn't even know were there. I've heard, <laughs> you might laugh, but I've heard from a couple of people who've gone, I've fired this up and I found this view in my app that was even animating and I don't even know what it was. <laughs> it was just dancing around doing its little thing, so it's good for finding that. In the middle, it's highlighting opaque views. That's good for, um, particularly in table views, oh, sorry, it's highlighting non-opaque views. As probably all of you know, the iPhone hates drawing any sort of transparencies. So you really want to get everything to be opaque. And you can go into Interface Builder and look through your code and find all your opaque views, but really sometimes you just want to hit a button and it's right there and shows you sort of what's going on. And you don't want to be doing it. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these things actually are in are in instruments, but it's like, particularly on this thing, it takes forever to launch, and it's just a pain. It's only on the device. The transparency. Yeah. Some way you can set to get it in the Well, yeah. That's even that's a little bit different because it's um, I think that's CA layer. Um, if it's drawing it off screen or something. It's a little bit different. That just that just looks for the flag, so it's really simple. So it's it's only as useful as it goes, sort of thing. Um, so obviously, I showed logging out all the properties. It'll try and basically, I'll show how it's done later. But basically, it'll look at each property, and even if it's one that you've written yourself on a custom UI view, and try and work out what it is and how best to represent that in the log. So if it's color, it will show. RGB, if it's um, an auto resizing view, then it can actually show you exactly flexible width, flexible margin, all that sort of thing. Um, outline your views, which I th think might actually be possible with instruments as well. I know it is on the Mac, maybe it's not, I don't know, but that it's good to have it just on a button. Um, you can also manually call set needs display layout and reload data, which is a bit of a convenience sometimes, just so you don't have to set up a button somewhere to reload the table view. It's just handy to have that there. Um, the accessibility properties is great for if you're doing UI automation and you're not using, or even if you are using something like Frank or the various other frameworks out there, if you want to write the scripts yourself, that's there. Oh, and one thing that I didn't actually show is you can move the views around and resize them at runtime. I might actually just jump out and get back to Xcode, because this can be really handy if you're pulling apart Apple's views. So for example, with this one, you can actually just take it, and with the arrow keys, you can just, <laughs> you can just see how they've kind of put it together. And then you can go back and push layout sub views and all put it back together. So things like table views, you can really see how they've kind of put things together and on like this switch there's just this random little thing there. Who knows what that does? So that's another good way of looking at things. Uh, and one of the basic things that I aim to do with this, except for when you're moving things around, is that everything should be non-destructive. So if you just fire up the introspect and are poking around and looking at things and logging out properties, it should ideally not change your views in any way. So it tries to kind of hold on to things weakly and it, it, there's certain things that it does with CO layers to kind of avoid ever changing the view itself. So you can kind of have that guarantee that if you go in there and change something, then it is actually what it's meant to be. Or if you don't change something, sorry. Um, as far as setup goes, it's really easy. You just add the Quartz framework if you don't already have it and set up a debug environment variable, which I think is on by default now. And then in your app delegate, you just import the header file and it's a singleton that you do one call and, and that's it. Um, the way I recommend using it is wrapping it in the 
iPhone simulator if deaf, just because there are private calls in there and if that makes it to the store, well, I won't because it'll just get rejected automatically. And you can actually use it on the device with a Bluetooth keyboard, so you never know, one of your users might somehow discover something. <laughs> uh, if they're really bored one day, I don't know. So this is an example of, that I showed before. In a little bit more detail at the top, it's got the inheritance down to NS objects, which is the same as you see in Apple's documentation. And then the UI, UI view properties and the target and action. So basically that second half is anything that's, um, so that one down there is anything that's specific to that view. So if it's a custom view, you have all your publicly available properties down there. Uh, this is an example of a table view. So you get all your stuff down there. It's pretty handy. With um, It even gives you the gesture recognizers. If anyone knows what that is. <laughs> I don't know. When I took that, it wasn't... Like, I wasn't touching anything that says possible, so I don't, I don't even know what that's about. It's doing something funny down there. Uh, and the accessibility properties down there again. Um, it's also got a, a recursive description. This is a private method that you can call on UI view. This is one of the private methods that I use to do what Introspect does. And it's really detailed. It gives you every single view this is a table view, so up the top you can see the table view and then it goes down to cell and every single view in that. And it's kind of ridiculous when you log it out, but it can be, if you need to know exactly what the hell's going on in your view and why, how everything is nested within one another, then that can be really helpful. Showing view outlines, that's a pretty good example of that. It's good for finding rogue views that have somehow made their way in there. And that's showing it says showing view outlines, but it should be showing opaque, non-opaque views. So again, that's pretty good for performance and that sort of thing. There's also flash on draw rect, and the way you implement this is inside the draw rect of the view that you want to flash, you have to call that. And you can, so you just do flash rect in view. The rect you can, you can use self bounds if you want to do the whole view, but I prefer just do rect so that you know, because sometimes you're only redrawing part of the rect or you should be if that's the only part that needs to be done. And then that'll basically just throw a CA layer on and you can change the color if you want to and then just take it off straight away. So every time that's redrawn, that'll get called and it will flash. And there is a flag that you can set in instruments, but again, that's, you're never in instruments when you want to be and you've got to quit out and blah, blah, blah. So this is handy. You can just sort of throw it on there when you need to. Um, next part, I'm going to go into how I... Oops. How, how it was put together and kind of the workings of it. Because a couple of people have said to me, oh, you know, I'll know where to start with something like that. It's actually really simple. And when you look through it, it's not really that much going on. It's more just kind of a bunch of hacks to work around and see what is going on on the screen. So with that said, don't put this stuff in the app store because you will get rejected. And I don't even know why you're doing this stuff in an app. I mean, people do crazy stuff, but yeah, just don't do that. So Shortcuts is basically done with a hidden text view and a blank input view. The input view is just if you want to create a custom keyboard, you can supply your own input view and then feed that back to the text view using a bunch of methods and all that. So I just set a blank UI view for that and then I've got control. I get keyboard input throughout the whole app, um, but you don't see the keyboard and you don't see the text field, so it's basically... It looks like magic, but really it's just kind of a hack. And then if the app needs to use the keyboard so another text view will take over the keyboard, then I just reclaim it after that notification and a small delay because it's very hacky and all that. Keyboard modifiers, I can't take credit for this. The guy who thought of this sent me a pull request on GitHub and I looked at it for a couple of minutes and I just went, that's really smart how he did it. Basically, oh, it's OXCD, if you want to look him up. That's actually his name. Just look at the yeah, just look <laughs> probably easier. But basically, he sets up the text field with that string in it and the cursor in the middle. And so if you push left, the cursor will move once to the left, and then he resets it if, you, if it moves 
one's to the right. But if you hold Shift, it will actually select five. And if you hold Alt, it will jump to the end of that word. So then you basically look at the position of the cursor and then reset it after every key press. <laughs> And then you've got keyboard modifiers. It seriously, this I don't, I don't even know how he thought of that. It's just very clever. But yeah, I wouldn't recommend doing that in your app. Probably, <laughs> probably going to break pretty soon. And you can change all the key bindings in that file there. Really easy. Flashing and highlighting views. Sorry, finding and highlighting views. This is pretty simple. It basically, when you start it, it just overlays a view over the main window. It only works with one window um, at the moment. So it just overlays a view on there, captures the touches, and then uses convert point of view to basically drill straight down the, the view hierarchy and looks at every view on the screen and then works out which ones are under that point and then just builds up an array of those and then you start at the top. And there's a, a keyboard shortcut where you can jump down the view hierarchy. So if you push page up, it will go to that view, super view, and then on and on down the road like that, and you can push page down to come back up. So it's a pretty simple system, and then they're just the way the outline is done. I've got another invisible view that just uses draw ret to do all the drawing. Pretty simple, and then you just the rest of it's just maths, just working out the you know that edge to that edge and all the rest of it. So logging properties is yeah, this is bit of a difficult one. Basically, you need to use the Objective-C runtime and do that sort of thing, which is not really where you want to be, but it gets the job done. I don't really, is there a legitimate use for this sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. Okay. so it's dynamically introspecting the properties. You can do like um, active record <coughs> style stuff where you ah, right. the properties should be there, or you might want to look at the properties and map them to some file or database or something like that. So. Well, that's how you do it. Good luck with it. I'm probably not. <laughs> I mean, you could you could use it, but it, I guess you need to have a little bit more familiarity than I do. Um, I sort of got the job done, and then getting the target actions is um, is actually really easy. There's um, some methods built on your control to do that, so that was a lot easier. Just to conclude, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about open sourcing things and where I think the value is in that. Since I open source DC Introspect, it's really, uh, it's obviously opened up a lot of doors for me and it's really got my name out there. But it's really, it's a, the way I look at it is it's a better CV than your actual CV because people can see exactly how you code and what your style is and your attention to detail and things like that. And they can see how you approach problems, your design patterns, and a lot of your knowledge. And it's also a really good way of learning. A lot of development is just learning new technologies. Like really, you just either learning new technology or getting your head around a new project that you're working on, all these different things. And so if you're open sourcing things and accepting changes back and accepting feedback, then that's kind of showing a willingness to learn. And that's something that I think people should look for when they're developing, uh, sorry, when they're hiring developers. So I'd really recommend that everyone put something on, on GitHub it's really, I don't know what's up with their logo, but it's a place to be. Um, and it's really, if you can get some good code up there and something that people will really use, it's in, I think, I mean, depending on what license you choose, people will use it more or less. I'm not going to advocate for any particular license, but I guess the more liberal it is, the more it will get used. And the more it gets used, the more people will know who you are and and your code will find its way into some really cool projects, which has happened to me recently. So that's it. Thanks for listening. Any questions for Patrick? What sort of channels did you use to get your, your code known and get people to hear about it? Uh, I just tweeted it. And at the time, I think I had like 20 something followers. <laughs> and now I've got like 80 or so, but um, <laughs> but seriously, I just tweeted it and someone happened to see it and it got retweeted and then it got compared to Firebug, which, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's probably being a little bit generous, but I'm, I'll take that. I'm happy to take that. So it's, and then once people got onto it, it really just like it exploded. I've got, 
a lot of attention on GitHub and a lot of people who are actually actively feeding back, which is really good. And um, yeah, and I guess once, particularly once people sort of looked at my Twitter profile and saw I was from Melbourne, it was kind of like, oh, okay, he's local and we can, you know, and he's coming to the next meeting and all that sort of thing. And then you just tell people you are. So it was really, I think I was pretty lucky with that. I've, there's a lot of really, really good code on GitHub that people just don't even know it exists, you know? So I guess I was lucky. I don't know. <laughs> but if you write something that people use, then it's, that's the key. Because if it's something that's really cool, um, maybe using a blog post, I don't know. But like if it's something that people are actually going to, can use every day, that's the thing people have said to me, oh, I actually use that thing in my project and it helped me save like five minutes. And that doesn't sound like much, but when you get saved, if you're trying to solve a bug or something and then this tool solves it, it's kind of like, yes, thank you for saving me five minutes. <laughs> Uh, that, that you mentioned blog posts. So I recently just put, I had a problem at work and I was like, oh, okay, I'll write blog posts, put, mm. it, put some code in there. And then like a couple of weeks later, I get ping back from Stack Overflow where someone says, I was you know, using this thing from this blog, but, but I can't do it right or something. And I'm like, yeah. It's because you didn't do this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> you didn't read my entire blog post. <laughs> but, you know, yeah. It's like this internet feedback loop, you know. That, yeah, exactly. Out, the more you know, people notice, the more you get. You know, is, is the maintenance yeah. of the library actually becoming more work as more people get to know it and they start submitting <laughs> pull requests and you're like, oh, you know, created a monster? Or is uh, it kind of well, I just put it on there and I kind of haven't done much. No. <laughs> uh, I've, well, there's been a couple of really good pull requests, so that's um, helped out. Actually, after I said how great that guy was who came up with the keyboard things, I was testing it today and I found out that it crashes when you go to help screen. So in his little method that he added, so I might, you know, you, you really have to be careful with that, but it's not. Um, there is some maintenance involved, but I guess if it's something you're using all the time, if something breaks, you just jump in and fix it. And then every now and then you just push it back up and and hope it doesn't break too much. Jason, the uh, play up guys contributing to the <laughs> that's a very good question. <laughs> we, are, we are by feeding him. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's true, yeah. They're funny, you know, I guess. <laughs> it actually breaks our it's actually breaks It's one of us. Damn open source software. Yeah. So I said, well, that's, that's why I said it's not meant for the store, you know. You can't blame me. <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned your app. You showed a lovely screenshot, but you didn't tell us the name of it. Oh, it's called MIDI Touch. It's um it's it been out since like October last year I think and it's basically an app that you run on your iPad or your iPhone and you use it to control MIDI hardware so some people will know what that is it's basically just musical instruments and you can do it wirelessly or wired. Any other questions? Can I use it with Siri and Uh, oh, that's a good point. It, it only, at the moment, it only supports you I've used. So CA layers, I'm thinking about adding a different mode where we'll add support for that because I use them a bit myself. And yeah, they're fairly, um, they're good for sort of disappearing down holes and that sort of thing as well. So yeah, look out for that. I'll add it at it, some it point. Patches accepted. Yeah. Patches accepted. <laughs> Please. How long ago did you uh, about four days before I put it on GitHub, I guess. So, That's a good effort. <laughs> long days, but no. Yeah, it, like I said, it's pretty simple. And a lot of the stuff that I was doing, there was good code samples on the web. So, I mean, it's not quite, it's not a case of obviously just cutting and pasting. But if you can see how, for example, getting the properties out, that was one that I really wanted to do. And I, I like, where do you even start with that? How do you do that? And it turns out that um, it's possible and it's been added to the runtime and a few people have done it and it's code out there and you just sort of... What actually motivated you to do it in the first place? Was there some... Were you doing this thing, uh, this stuff a lot and you thought there must be a better way to... Do you, well, it, all, every single time when you're building something in code, like a piece of a, a view or whatever it is, and you go in there and you go, oh, it needs to be one pixel to the left and you quit and then change it by one pixel and then... So with this, I thought, I just want to be able to push a key, see where all my views are, move them around, and then log it out. But so and do you then transcribe those? 
oh, your well, frames, it, and then, or do you somehow feed that back into your app? Well, it, that's another thing I didn't mention. It's got you push. I think it's a zero key, and then the frame of the view. If you've moved move that view around, then it will print out the code in the log. Right. So it'll say like view dot frame equals CG rect. You know, blah blah blah. So a bit like some of those color pickers that sort of actually give you the, the UI color color. Yeah, word. yeah. It doesn't put it in the code itself, but you know, <laughs> I'm doing what I can. You know. <laughs> but also, it came from yeah, my app MIDI Touch is everything's built dynamically, so it was just an absolute pain when you moving things around and you're just dumping like a whole view with say hundreds of controls on it that you're reading off an XML file, and then if you you know, you do one thing wrong and then suddenly everything's all over the shop and you're like, why are things invisible or why is this here? And so it's really handy for that. Just seeing where all your views are is kind of giving a little bit of power back. It really feels like something that should be there anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Are you worried about Apple sort of stealing this concept and coming up with something on their own? <laughs> well, I'm not making any money out of it, so... <laughs> Well, someone, one of the first things someone said was they go, Apple should hire this guy. And I'm like, Apple yeah. people read this. You don't read it. I'm here. I'm here. So everybody go to GitHub and, you know, watch, watch the project and um, yeah. maybe, we can, maybe we can help Pat get to Cupertino. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll just take two seconds. Um, thanks, Pat, for the presentation. It's fantastic. <laughs>